Hello everyone, welcome to the third in our public lecture series on people and pandemics and today we're looking at the opportunity perhaps to create a better world. Uh, I'm Philip Lloyd, I'm Vice Principal here at Queen Mary University of London and I'm joined today by Professor Norman Fenton, uh, who is Professor of Risk and Information Management here at Queen Mary by Dr. James Bradley, who's a lecturer in environmental science here at Queen Mary, and also Professor Barbara Taylor, who is Professor of Humanities here. And uh, each panel member is gonna just say a few words from their point of view and their area of expertise, and then we're gonna go into a discussion on this topic of potential for a better world. So, uh, Norman, over to you. Okay, well, I'll start with what we've done that's unique and adds value. So our research focuses on uh, quantitative risk assessment and a lot of it in health. So obviously we've done a lot of research and produced numerous reports about COVID risk. Now, where we differ from almost all others in this area is that we don't simply do statistical number crunching. We look at causal explanations for the data, biases, uncertainty about its accuracy, and key data that's missing. And we build causal models using knowledge as well as data and use novel statistical methods to produce assessments and predictions that we believe are more accurate and informative because they take full account of all of those factors. So for example, when infection and fatality rates were first being reported, the only people in the UK being tested for COVID were patients already hospitalised with severe symptoms. And that meant that fatality rates for COVID positive patients were overestimated. And then international comparisons were meaningless without understanding differences in national testing and death reporting strategies. Yet most people assumed that differences were due mainly to things like when the lockdown began, demographic factors and healthcare quality. We also expose flaws in reports about particular COVID risk factors. So for example, some well-publicized studies claim that smoking reduces the risk of COVID death. And we showed how that may be completely explained by bias in the data. And for the same reason, we predicted and explained why hypertension would seem counterintuitively to be a factor that reduces risk as some studies did indeed claim. And then we've also done a lot of work related to symptom tracking apps. We identified problems with the government solution before it was rolled out in the Isle of Wight and then abandoned shortly afterwards. And in collaboration with clinicians, we've just published a personalized symptom tracking and risk assessment app based on a comprehensive causal model, which we believe gets around most of the, uh, the problems. Now, what is it that the public don't know and that I think that they, they need to know? Well, I don't think the public is fully aware of how arbitrary much of the reported data is. So, for example, we, we were long ago warning about the problems with the COVID death reporting. And then last week, it was revealed in the UK that if you've ever been assessed as having COVID, then you'll always be considered COVID positive and your death will be reported as a COVID death, even if you're run over by a bus. That's, that's a bit like the Hotel California. You, you can, you can uh, check out any time you like, but you can never leave. But even those who, who saw that story are probably unaware that it's not unique to the UK. The World Health Organization guidelines essentially say that anybody who might have COVID who dies should be classified as a COVID death. I think the public's also unaware of just how uncertain we are about the accuracy of the various different testing methods and incorporating that uncertainty into our, into our models shows that infection rates are higher than most people believe, while fatality rates are lower. So on a positive message that the disease is not as deadly as most assume. And while not, not everybody believes the mantra that we're being led by the science, I don't think the public is aware of the extent to which much reported research is driven by political narratives rather than science. And I'm happy to give examples later like that of the hydrochloroquine scandal. And then in terms of what, what are we doing, what's special, what's special for the local community and the global implications? Well, for the local community here, it's disproportionately uh, black and minority ethnic fame. And our symptom and risk assessment model empowers individuals with personalized risk assessment, which helps understand and explain BAME risk in the context of underlying causal factors, which incidentally are also common to groups like Orthodox Jews, who we actually showed had, a, had the highest COVID fatality rates. And more generally, our, model, uh, our models enable comprehensive, risk, uh, comprehensive analysis of risk 
which can answer global questions uh, like what type of interventions are optimal taking account of multiple conflicting objectives so uh, i'll finish by just saying what, what are the key messages don't believe the head don't believe the headline figures about covid risk or risk factors the message is actually positive i think the risk has been exaggerated in fact when taking into account the multiple factors I've, I've identified. It's not clear that the overall fatality rate is worse than some relatively recent flu epidemics like 1998, 99. And that's before we consider how many cancer, deaths, suicides, et cetera, will actually result from the unprecedented lockdown and economic damage. Thank you very much, Norman. I've got some a couple of questions for you based on that, but we'll come back to those in a short while. Uh, James, over to you. Okay, um, my name is James Bradley and I'm a lecturer in environmental science uh, here at Queen Mary. I joined the School of Geography at Queen Mary in 2019. Prior to that, I was working at the University of Southern California in the US. And um, so I'm an environmental scientist and my research I'm interested in understanding the biogeochemical processes that occur on Earth. So that includes things like the cycling of carbon that drives the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. I'm interested in understanding the coevolution of life and its environment. So understanding how life arose and how it responds to and drives changes in its physical and chemical environment. Um, so in doing that, I study some of the most extreme environments on Earth, including the glaciers and ice sheets of the Arctic and the Antarctic, which are also some of the most sensitive places on the planet to climate change. Um, and I think that I will speak mostly today kind of about what I perceive to be some of the environmental impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and whether or not it might be encouraging a switch to uh, renewable energy. So I can go into some of that now if you like, or we can come back to it. Yeah. Um, so during the coronavirus lockdown, um, we and other nations from around the world stayed at home. Um, our cars were left idle and the skies were largely empty of planes. So, um, you know, we would expect that to have a very significant environmental impact. While we've been locked down, we've seen really frightening impacts of climate change. Um, we've seen heat waves across the Arctic, temperatures in Siberia a few weeks ago reached 38 degrees centigrade above the Arctic Circle. So the planet hasn't stopped responding, but we have initially seen a drop, a rapid drop in CO2 emissions. So the data is showing us that um, globally CO2 emissions decreased by about 17% in early April compared with the previous year and at their peak. Um, individual countries were decreasing in carbon emissions by about 20, 26% on average. Um, but unfortunately, it hasn't been sustained. So as we've been coming out of a lockdown environment, carbon emissions have, been, have rebounded substantially. And it, it's looking like the savings that have been triggered by coronavirus are kind of halving within weeks. Um, so the overall impact of coronavirus in terms of its um, impact on, on global CO2 emissions and therefore the environmental impact is expected to be about a minus 7% reduction um, if at best if restrictions remain worldwide until the end of 2020. So that's an at best scenario for the environment but probably a worst case scenario for you know people wanting to live their daily lives. So to put that number into context, um, well, I think the most likely scenario is that we're gonna see about a 4% decrease in global CO2 emissions this year. And that would take us down to about 2016 levels of emissions. So 35 billion tons of CO2 emitted per year. Um, and 2016 was when the world came together in an emergency summit to sign the Paris Agreement. So it does seem that unfortunately, global lockdown is not a sufficient means by which to warn off dangerous climate change. And I've got, you know, I've got more to say about that. There are many more environmental problems that come along with 
the coronavirus pandemic. So for example, waste management study published in Science recently has illuminated that the pandemic has led to an abrupt collapse of the waste management chains on a global basis, as well as a massive increase in the amount of medical waste and domestic waste. Um, so yeah, I'm very pleased to talk more about these things um, and happy you know, to answer your questions as well. Thank you very much, James. We'll come back to questions in a moment, but uh, Barbara, over to you. I'm principal investigator um, on a Wellcome Trust funded project um, on solitudes, uh, past and present. And what I'm going to talk about today kind of arises from some of the work that we do. I'm going to talk briefly about the politics of loneliness in Britain, in pandemic um, Britain. And um, in recent years, we've heard um, much from UK politicians about an epidemic of loneliness, more deadly, we're told, um, than any other health threat. Um, we even have a government minister for loneliness. Now in the midst of a global pandemic, we're hearing uh, far less about this, um, but a politics of loneliness is still with us, um, although in ways, our government is much less eager to acknowledge. Uh, loneliness has always had a political dimension and the first person to really theorize this was Hannah Arendt, um, who in her 1951, the, politic, uh, the Origins of Totalitarianism, drew a, an influential distinction between solitude and loneliness. And solitude, she said, was a positive experience of being, in her words, alone together with oneself. This is a self-companionship rooted in the inner dialogues of thought. And totalitarianism, she argued, destroys this two-in-one of solitude, replacing it with loneliness as people's capacity for free thinking was overwhelmed by ruthless totalitarian logic, which she described as a simultaneous loss of self and the world resulting in absolute loneliness destructive, she said, of all human living together. Well, we don't live in um, totalitarian times, at least not yet, but the loneliness um, that Arendt describes has resonance for us. Solitude can indeed be a, a positive state. I mean, many, many people in lockdown have in fact described it like this, although many others um, have experienced it as a debilitating isolation. But today, as in our end day, we're all suffering from a politically fostered loneliness. Although to understand this, I think we need to turn to another 1950s theorist of solitude, uh, the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott. In 1958, Winnicott described the capacity to tolerate solitude or even to enjoy it as a developmental achievement of early childhood acquired through the experience of receiving care from a parental figure, usually the mother. As a small child matures, this caring figure is internalized to serve as an inner presence, a self-companion when the child is alone. The state of being alone, Winnicott writes, paradoxically always implies that someone else is there. And for a person who has had no reliable care, solitude is unendurable. A person, when a cut writes, may be in solitary confinement and not be able to be alone. How greatly he must suffer is beyond the imagination. Well, it seems to me that in recent months, many people have been suffering in just this way. Some have never received the care that makes aloneness tolerable, or many others have found the caregiving presence crumbling under the pressure of enforced isolation. People with chronic illness or disabilities, Prisoners, homeless people, those with psychological disorders, older people in care homes. I think here we have had a real loneliness crisis, an existential threat, as one expert describes it. It may be lessening now for some as lockdown eases, but the cost of ongoing infection risks. Mental health providers have been hearing much about this and suicide rates have been climbing. But there's another kind of loneliness I want to suggest that afflicts everyone in this country as we look to our government to get us through this crisis and find no care at all. As with Trump in the United States, the carelessness of Boris Johnson, Dominic Cummings and their cronies is an existential threat to every Briton. Tens of thousands have not survived this threat and many more will die from it. 
or emerge damaged in a host of ways. I'm sure I don't need to remind anyone listening to this about the manifold shameful ineptitudes of this government that have resulted in the second highest per capita death rate in the world. This reckless disregard has been and remains terrifying and the terror goes deep, exposing our vulnerability not just to disease, but to the heartlessness of the powerful. Such callous carelessness isn't new, although rarely has it been so flagrant. Long years of neoliberal austerity have paved the way, asset stripping the NHS and care services, hollowing out the public sector. The pre-COVID loneliness epidemic was mostly a proxy for this assault on care. Rates of self-reported loneliness among older people have changed little over the last 60 years. There's been an increase in life changes that can trigger bouts of loneliness. But even here, the figures are far below those publicized by media and government. So while the headlines about loneliness is the plague of our times, the answer, I'm arguing, lies with the demolition of services and institutions that have the public good as a core value from youth clubs and day centers to public library and above all, so-called social care. The hypocrisy of governments that talk about loneliness while systematically destroying key sources of social connectedness is breathtaking. So finally, in this current health crisis, what do we do? Death to the mercies of an uncaring government. Well, across Britain, people have turned to each other in a huge upwelling of mutual aid and volunteer action. Kindness to strangers has been everywhere. This has been wonderful to witness, but it's not enough. Democratic regimes have an obligation to care for the people they claim to represent. Our collective loneliness will only be relieved when this care is forthcoming. And those who have not provided it are held to account, not later, but now, before we are engulfed by a second wave of sickness and death in this unfolding tragedy of careless governments. Thanks. Thank you very much, Barbara. Gosh, some very different uh, perspectives there. Norman, I'm going to go back to you because uh, while people might feel uh, sort of cheered up by the fact that you're saying it's not as bad as uh, people have said, that probably more people have had it than is thought, uh, and that the fatality rate is not so great. And I can understand that at a sort of macro level, but at an individual level, it's still very hard, surely, to determine your own individual risk. I mean, I know people that don't necessarily fall into any particularly obvious risk category who've had it extremely badly. Uh, and so, um, you know, walking along the street, thinking about jumping on public transport feels a, a bit of a lottery when you don't know yourself, you know, are you going to be one of the 80% that doesn't seem to get it or get it so mildly you don't know that you've got it? I should say that rather more asymptomatic, or are you going to be one of the ones that gets it really badly? So do any of your models help us or any of your risk assessments help us I'd be able to assess our own personal risk? Yes, in fact, the, the model I mentioned that we, we've just published this week does do this and um, I don't think that the, 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 uh, the lack of personalized risk assessment that you're suggesting is there actually is, is as bad as that. Well, I think that we're, we're pretty good, actually. We, we can do pretty well at predicting, based on personal risk factors, the risk of death from this, right? We, 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 we're, pretty, we're, we're pretty sure, we're pretty comfortable about what those are. I mean, essentially... Well, I mean, this is very common knowledge. If you're if you're below seventy without any significant comorbidities, it's almost certain that you're not going to die of this, right? Um, we do separate. We do have separated data, although nothing like as much as we'd like, on the difference between those who are get it with mild symptoms and severe. So, there is a, a concern uh, which I empathise with with what you said there. That it is definitely the case that people who on some of the normal risk factors that are very accurate in predicting death, let's say, are quite poor at distinguishing between whether you're going to be mild or severe. And I know, I know from, from my own friends that severe, the, 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 those people who get the severe symptoms, it, it, is, it is very bad, right? It can be very bad. And I mean, the thing is that, that, that 
ordinary flu can also be very, very bad. That can have similarly debilitating systems. So th there's that issue as well. But there is, you know, that th there. I think that the, what we're doing with our models is exactly what you you suggest. You know might not be possible and that is to highly personalize get highly personalized ongoing assessments of, of the risk but can i just challenge you on one point there because um you also hear you you hear about the covid long haulers so the people that have it chronically not acutely and you also keep hearing uh although this is more coming out in dribs and drabs about the fact that the virus is having neurological impacts or it's having other impacts on people's system. Even people who had it mildly are apparently suffering in ways going forward, which people think can be traced back to the virus. So yeah, what that, do you think that, about? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical I'm, I'm skeptic about that because um, the, there is certainly not the data to, to support that. At the moment, I mean, to, to make those claims about the very nature of the claims that people may suffer long term, for example, um, uh, long term lung conditions may suffer long term um, brain conditions. I mean, the whole point is we don't know in the long term. These are just it, it is speculation. A lot of this at the moment. So what's your app called and should we all download it? So it's. Yes, um, I'm happy to put, we haven't given it a name yet. It's, it's, it's a privacy, it's called a privacy preserving causal model for personalized Bayesian symptom yeah, tracking. Yeah. yeah, but we, so, yeah, so we, we need to come up with something snappy, but you can, yes, but it, I'll be um, happy to share, well, we're happy to share of the necessary uh, details to, to get it. It will be on the app store at some stage with a slightly snappier we, name. We haven't put it on the app store yet but we're you know that's something that we'll we'll consider the problem the problem there is a problem incidentally about a lot of the research that's going on at the moment right we could end up it, it could we could end up effectively reporting it'd be like reporting on strategies for 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 winning the battle of waterloo that by the time that this gets kind of like what these things get widely accepted it's already too late or it's become completely irrelevant so there is a danger of that yeah, yeah, no, I, I can see that. I can see that. I think people just want to know. I think it's quite confusing. You get a lot of confusing signals from government and people don't really know, is it safe to go on public transport or not? How safe is it? It's quite hard to assess. Anyway, I'll come back to you. That's really interesting, Norman. Thank you very much. Barbara, back to you. You spoke about loneliness and solitude and the sort of mental health trauma that people will have been undergoing uh not everybody but some people certainly uh during lockdown and you know we do we don't have some of the social institutions really embedded as well as we used to have so what do you think and you talked about mutual aid and volunteering but what else could people do to more concretely sort of help? Um, well, I guess my first answer to that would be, I think we need to exert massive pressure on our government to actually reinstitute a lot of the forms of social connectedness that existed um, you know, through a wide variety of institutions. Many of them operated through um, local authorities, which of course have been financially gutted. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, it, there isn't, I think, any short term solution to this. I mean, there's going to have, we, we, we will have a mental, we have had and have, have got and will have a mental health crisis on our hands. We know that already. Um, and the mental health system has been in very bad shape for years now it's no secret to anyone so i mean there's going to have to be a lot of additional funding there but i think i think what this is a crisis of care that we are facing a lot it's a health crisis and it's a crisis of care and it needs to be understood as a crisis of care and a government needs to be made to perceive that and have priorities shifted toward that. I mean, we cannot have a scenario as we have had now where 
you know, people in care homes are simply left to die on mass. Um, you know, we, 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 we cannot have the, 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 the kinds of forms of, of, of isolation that people are thrust into when the sorts of institutions on which they could previously rely, you know, from day centers through to libraries and so on and so forth, where, you know, the, the, these no longer exist. They have to be reinvented in some sense in this country. And I, so what's happened, I mean, along with exposing massive inequalities, um, you know, I mean, that slogan, we were all in it together at the beginning. I mean, if ever there was one that was shown completely nonsensical, I mean, you know, the, as well as these gross inequalities, we are faced with what austerity has done to care in this country. So I think there needs to be huge pressure on government to face up to that um, and to, you know, in terms of financial priorities, um, and in terms of reinvisiting, I mean, if we're talking, I would like to hear more about a green recovery, but I think we need a major care recovery in this country too, by which I don't mean just some people who are dependent and needy. We all need each other. We're all vulnerable. We all need forms of mutual support and aid and help, whatever point in our lives we're in. And it's understanding that, it's understanding the need for universal networks of care you know, that people can turn to and turn to each other within that I think we have to have. Yes, and I was very struck by your, you, you were contrasting solitude with loneliness and also how it's a developmental, uh, you, know, you can have the ability to cope with solitude and possibly to some degree a component of loneliness perhaps, mm. to a degree if you've had adequate care and oversight when you're younger but if that doesn't happen and that may happen to your parents but it may not mm. and so what other institutions can provide that care to help us all be more well-rounded in our capability to deal with the sort of rough times in life as well as and that was what i was taking from that as well and that can be something that could be focused on too to help us all be a bit more resilient and caring. Mm. Yes, I mean, I mean the. Um, I think I think it is true to say that the capacity to to tolerate solitude or to take pleasure from it um, is something that people do have to acquire through some sense of being um, of a caring figure that becomes sort of part of themselves. You know, you're held in the mind of other people, even if they're not there, you're sort of held in their minds. Or, you know, you have a sense of that. And, but that can crumble under pressure. And people have been, um, I mean, it's not just the very vulnerable people, it can happen to anyone. I mean, I was reading an account of a young woman who said she didn't know what was happening to her. She was having a panic attack. She'd never had a panic attack before in her life. But the, 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 the pressures that people have been under during lockdown, and she just said she just felt completely alone, utterly abandoned. So I think it, we, we're going to be hearing more and more about the consequences of no government, no government could protect us completely from this virus. I mean, you know, it's just not possible. I mean, but the fact that some have done so much better than others and how they have done so much better than others, the refusal of our government to acknowledge how badly they have done. Um, you know, I mean, my sister lives in British Columbia. And when I talk to her about the experience of the pandemic there and I compare it to my experience here, that's when I really feel left in the lurch by our government. Because she, the questions you were asking, how do we know if we are individually at risk? Well, there's no one sure way of knowing, but when she has public health officers in British Columbia talk about exactly what's going on in the province, exactly what the risks look like, what it's safe for people to do, she knows she's talking to people who have the interests of the population at heart and have been working very hard on their behalf. So it makes a huge difference. Yes, I went to a very good Public Health England briefing the other day about London and it was eye-opening and reassuring. And, you, and yet only a few of us were at that briefing. <laughs> uh, James, um, so you made it sound like, uh, well, there was hope, 
um, carbon emissions went down. People could hear birdsong in Wuhan, which they hadn't heard for like decades. Uh, and now perhaps actually in going back, carbon emissions going back up, but you talked about all the waste and people, because we, some of us were discussing this at another area this afternoon, because of how perhaps we're going to be behaving to try and reduce the transmission of the virus, that could actually put a greater strain on carbon emissions. And yet the whole world has taken action to a greater or lesser extent, as Barbara has said, in order to uh, take control of the virus. Climate change poses a much greater danger actually to humanity and the planet, but you, we haven't managed yet to really galvanize action in the same way. So do you see any hope from the ability to galvanize action on COVID to galvanize action more decisively on climate change? Yeah, that's a really, um, it's a really good point. Uh, I think something that the pandemic has shown us very clearly is that the climate crisis, you know, that um, scientists refer to it as, and it's sometimes referred to in media, sometimes referred to a bit more widely in government now, um, has never been treated as a crisis, really. Um, so, you know, as soon as we have a health crisis, a, a global pandemic, we can see that most world leaders are able to act swiftly and decisively in response to that. Um, you know, locking down entire cities, entire countries, um, taking extreme economic measures. They're, they're really able to respond to this crisis and the same urgency has been completely missing for the climate crisis. So, you know, that's become really, really apparent through this. In terms of uh, whether or not that might translate into a hopeful outlook, um, yeah, if people can kind of wake up to that fact, um, maybe that's a, a good way for people to put pressure on institutions, on governments, on industry, um, to sort of make true of their word to tackle this crisis. Um, so yeah, if we can get uh, voices together, I'm, I'm hopeful of that, you know, we can frame it in that kind of way. You think there's an opportunity as well, though, to, uh, and Norman touched on this too, and actually this is a question for all three of you. Um, so governments, our government has said it's been led by the science. Some governments, the US government, I won't comment actually as to whether they, I mean, there, there is a lot of science there, but they're not being particularly led by it. But is there an opportunity here for science to really prove its worth? you know, with the vaccine coming through possibly from Oxford and therefore for, I'm using that so that then people think that scientists are, because experts have been a bit trashed, worth listening to, I'm making this very simplistic, therefore on climate change, experts worth listening to, rather than undermined people questioning motives, you know, always throwing in sort of different types of data even if they're not accurate or not i just wondered if there's an opportunity to sort of not that scientists are always right but the process of investigation exploration evidence gathering synthesis and development of findings um i just wondered if there was an opportunity here to sort of rehabilitate science in the public's mind in a way that could be helpful for climate change yeah i would like to think so um and you know, people might say that their policy is being guided by science, but um, there's also a very clear balance between making policies based on scientific evidence and making policies based on economic interests and um, social welfare interests. So to say that in the UK, our policy has been based primarily on the science, I don't necessarily agree with completely. I think if it was completely based on the science, we wouldn't be coming out of lockdown. Um, we would, yeah, I think we would be, be behaving in somewhat different ways, just like if our environmental policy was purely based on science, there's no way that we would be behaving in the way that um, we do collectively 
as institutions, as many individuals are doing. Okay, thank you. And uh, either Norman or Barbara, did you want to come in on that at all? Well, Norman, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm happy to come in on that. Well, <laughs> I'd be a bit more pessimistic on this one because I actually think that, um, if anything, what's happened with the, um, the scientific reporting and a lot of the scientific prediction, a lot of the, for example, the prediction models that were out there at the beginning, that as a result of that, actually, there's going to be less confidence in um, in, in scientists and uh, an, an expert opinion because I think that there's been something of a loss of loss of credibility. And to be fair, I, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll come back to the point I made. I, I, I am concerned. I did say that that one of my concerns was concerns was that a lot of what is um, presented as um, scientific expert evidence is, is, is actually very much driven by political narratives. And to be fair, I mean, Barbara, I mean, you, you made a highly, politi a highly politicized um, uh, statement, a number of them in reference to, you know, effectively, you know, who's to blame for this? It was a very highly politicized statement. I'm not sure that that type of, um, that type of rhetoric is going to help improve the public trust in scientific um, an expert opinion and I'll go back to I'll go back to the example that I was gonna I said I would I would come back to which was the um, the 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 the, um, the hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine example I mean basically the Lancet published this um, paper which effectively uh, dismissed the the benefits of uh, hydroxychloroquine in treating uh, COVID and anybody anybody with the, with the slightest statistical knowledge in fact, with the slightest medical knowledge of how of how clinical studies, you know, take place, would have seen straight away that should never have been published. It simply was it simply was garbage, right? And yet it was published. And not only was it published in the Lancet, right? But it received this. It received like worldwide attention. You know, everybody was reporting it, and and and, and as a result, you know, that that particular treatment path was sort of closed down and and, and ridiculed. And yet. It was because it was convenient politically at the time. I'm going to details. To it was convenient politically to trash that as an option because of who was promoting it. And yet, actually, subsequently, much better studies, fairly convincing studies, have, uh, have suggested that it does include have, have benefits. And the World Health Organization has actually stopped trials now because it accepts that the benefits are clear. I'd like to just. Um, I think you make a really, really good point. Um, but I think a lot of the negative attention that science and the scientific process has got in light of the pandemic is due to the way that it's been spun by the media, um, distributed amongst politicians, informed policy, um, interpreted by the wider community. And, you know, journals, science is a working process and journals publish misleading studies occasionally but there's been a whole load of really good science that's been published. And, you know, it's the way that this, um, these stories are presented to people as to what, how people view science and their, their opinion on what scientific progress we're making with coronavirus. We have made tremendous leaps um, in terms of our advancements of uh, understanding the genome of the virus, the, you know, the genome was sequenced and is, is being investigated um, within you know, within months, we can understand aspects of the the, the COVID-19 genome well. Um, making progress towards a vaccine, understanding, you know, its impact on, on public health, the work that you're doing. Um, certainly don't, I don't wish to devalue that at all. I think it's, it's um, there's a tremendous amount of amazing science that's been uh, done. And unfortunately, a few studies that were misleading or even presented in misleading ways because of political pressure, because of economic pressure and because of uh, pressure within media and policy get much more attention. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. I think there's something about helping the public. Pub the public are not so um, well versed or in judging 
the science and the quality of the debate as they might be in reading, I don't know, like a restaurant review or a film review. They don't read reviews of science in the same way. They're much more accepting. And I think there's something there that's worth thinking about too. Barbara, you wanted to come in. Yes, I, I mean, I think to try and split off the science from the politics um, just isn't tenable. Um, I mean, I'm not suggesting for a moment that, you know, that there have been very important scientific studies, scientific advances, scientific controversies, and so on. But this pandemic, the handling of this pandemic, has been a very political matter. Um, it has varied enormously depending on what kind of governments are in power. The, uh, I mean, here I'm only echoing among other, the director of the Wellcome Trust, for example, who has talked about this at some length um, and with a great deal of heat. Um, also people from the uh, Independent Scientific Advisory Group, um, people within SAGE who have felt that they were silenced. The, um, uh, that we've now discovered that they had advised lockdown a week before it was actually instituted. So it's not a rhetorical question, it's a substantive one about the ways, um, I mean, I'm also echoing James on this, I mean, about the ways in which what gets through to people, what, what they learn, how they understand, and indeed um, the ways that science is actually able to inflect what happens um, is, is, has been a, a very, we, we don't have to have the very extreme examples of Trump and Bolsonaro um, to talk about that. I mean, we can see, uh, you know, I mean, many examples in many places, including in, in this country. I also wondered if I could just raise a, a question, if I may, which is for James, which is um, just to shift. Um, I'm um, I'm really really interested in what you forgot to say, and I'm one, and I'm thinking, supposing you had the power to design a green recovery for us, uh, what would it look like? Oof, that's a tough question. Um, I think it requires much more significant investment in resources than is currently pledged. Um, so I'd, I hate to talk just about the financial aspects of it, but that is what has been coming out recently, especially with the kind of coronavirus, coronavirus aid packages. Um, I think green spending got a £3 billion package recently agreed by the Chancellor in the UK, um, but there was billions more committed to airlines and car makers and um, funding fossil fuels in a recovery program. So I think that is not tenable with green recovery. Um, uh, it's a similar, similar picture in the EU. Um, the EU has unveiled its Green New Deal. There is a, a very significant sum of money contributed to that. Um, it's on, and I, yeah, I think nearly every aspect of the European economy will have to be overhauled in order to um, to implement it. But there's still investment in fossil fuel exploration and extraction. There's still subsidies. Um, we still don't have annual kind of binding carbon budgets. So these incentives really need to be uh, these policies incentives really need to be laid down and and agreed on a on a very wide level. Um, I think things need to be put more stringently into law in the same way that Heathrow Airport expansion was deemed unlawful because it um, failed to take into account of the UK's obligations to the Paris Agreement. Um, I think that, that we could be within fair right to challenge the package of green spending as not, not being sufficient in order to meet the UK's committed um, targets. And I think probably also the targets need to be revised. Um, the UK is committed to a net zero reduction by 2050 and the EU as well. Um, but this target is to take the percentage of risk of 1.5 degrees of warming to 50%, which is a coin toss, right? And it, these projections don't include some of the science that we know um, drives climate warming so various feedback loops within the earth system are not included in models that are made to project 
future climate change because we don't understand them on a well we have a good understanding of them but our ability to implement them robustly into models and constrain them in the same way we do other processes isn't quite there yet so we know that our models are missing various mechanisms that will produce additional warming um so i think i think these targets aren't um aspiring to achieve enough and i think it's unrealistic to expect that um we won't see disastrous ecological consequences even with a net a reduction to uh, net zero within 2050. I've got a, a question, maybe a sort of follow up to, to again to saying the Barbara just said said before. There, you said you you suggested that the advice which should have been um, taken up from from these other experts, from people within Sage and the Independent Sage, etc., was that we something to the effect that you know if only we'd have locked down one week earlier, then things would have been a lot different. But um, interestingly, m m many of the, the people who asked that question are the ones actually who are most vociferously opposed to stopping, for example, stopping flights from China much earlier and closing borders much earlier because, again, that conflicted with a political narrative of open borders. So somehow that wasn't, that wasn't okay to do that, but, but, but somehow, you know, locking down one or two weeks earlier was, is, is the big factor. And, and again, that's big. It's it's driven by the it's driven by political narrative. So I don't understand how you can how these things you know get get kind of like balanced out. Well, that is the job of politicians, though, isn't it? I mean, you so you give politicians evidence, and you will have scientific evidence, you'll have economic evidence, you'll have social policy evidence, and politicians who are democratically elected have to make the choice as to the sort of impact which they're try they're trying to ameliorate an impact and they're thinking of other impacts as well. So they can say they're led by the science, but ultimately it will always be a political choice depending on the priorities of the government. And sometimes these priorities are clearly stated and sometimes they're not. And that's, that's what we have. Uh, and you often have, I mean, like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, a lot of them, uh, they are in tension. They're not all completely aligned. Um, and uh, that's not to say that they aren't all worthy objectives, but there are trade-offs, there are always trade-offs. And as, you know, in any democracy, you have the people and sometimes you agree with those trade-offs and sometimes you don't. Uh, and that's what part of what we've been discussing here, actually, is that uh, possibly if some of us had been in power, we'd have made different trade-offs. And, you know, and that is what democracy is about actually you have to exercise your right when the time comes to vote for who you think best represents your views and values but what i take we're going to have to draw this to a close i mean what i take from this is we've had several crises all rolled into one uh, over the past few months uh, we have an ongoing one in climate obviously we've got actually an ongoing one in care which has been really highlighted over the past few months and then we have a whole set of issues, obviously, around health and risk and decision making. Uh, so one message I take from it is that the public, uh, us all included, should be pretty demanding, actually, consumers of the information we're fed. We shouldn't just take it at face value. Your point, Norman, about don't believe the headlines. But also James's point, you know, dig. Don't just take what you're fed. Dig into it. Explore other avenues and test and come, come to a view about what you need to do to make the world a better place. Buy a new car which is electric, or at least a hybrid. You might say it has to definitely be electric to have zero CO2, James, or whatever. Do your bit and also exercise your democratic right when the, vote, when the time comes to vote for whoever you think represents the country that you'd like the country to be. I'll stop it there. Thank you all very much. <laughs>